Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border. Today we're going through uh, a study in the book of Revelation using uh, E.D. Eliot's Jorge Apocalyptica as a guide and more specifically the abridgment to that great work, which is called The Last Prophecy. Um, so you can open your copy to about one page 183 and we'll pick up there in a minute. I uh, just wanted to invite everyone that's uh, watching these videos to join us live uh, every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, that, and that would be noon Eastern time, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time, when we have a live prophecy reality edition. Uh, we talk about, well, current events, things in the news, uh, different topics and series that we do on that broadcast every Wednesday. You can go to uh, firstmemberradio.com, click on the chat page, and there's a watch screen there that you can... Uh, as we do live streaming on YouTube, you can watch and join in the chat room there uh, with other listeners. And I would like to see you in there. So please, if possible, join us on Wednesday morning. And if it's not possible for you to join us on Wednesday morning, uh, you will find those broadcasts posted at my website, crosstheborder.org, uh, usually within uh, 24 hours. So you can pick that up. Uh, and on demand if you're not able to join us live. So definitely one way or another catch that broadcast. But if you do watch live, you can participate in the broadcast uh, by calling in or asking questions in the chat room. Or you can email me at any time, um, and I will usually answer any uh, pertinent questions uh, on the air if I get emailed questions. So uh, contact me. Go to crossborder.org, um, subscribe to my blog there, and on the contact page you can find an email address uh, where you can email me. Okay, we're going to jump back into the last prophecy, and we're finishing up one lecture here, and uh, we're on page 183, and I'm going to jump back a chapter just for the sake of continuity, and uh, we'll continue there. With respect to the other point, we adopt the principle of taking days in prophetic language to denote years, and we could mark as the primary commencement of the papal beast years of supremacy by subtracting the 1260 years from its termination, the date its papal head received its wound by the sword, to arrive at the beginning of its reign in 538 A.D. upon Emperor Justinian's decree found in the Code of Justinian that the Bishop of Rome be the supreme head over all churches, definer of doctrine, and corrector of heretics. This decree, although promulgated about 534, could not be given effect immediately because several groups warred against the Bishop of Rome, including the Ostrogoths, Vandals, and Heruli. After the first two were dealt with, the Ostrogoths besieged Rome in 15, 537 with the Pope inside the city walls. Thus, the Pope was effectively imprisoned by the Ostrogoths, who were certainly intent on overthrowing him. But in 538, Belisarius lifted the siege of Rome and the Pope was rescued. In that year also, Justinian replaced the deposed Silverius with Vigilius, as the new pope, and gave him military protection. Thus the decree and the church-state alliance achieved effective status. The 1260 years later, Napoleon took away by decree the pope's temporal authority and power to persecute. A few years after, the papal estates were restored, but not the persecuting power, nor the universal power over doctrine for Christendom. And we move on now to lecture 26, The Song of the 144,000, Supplemental History of the True, as distinguished from the nominal Reformed Church. And it says, read here chapters 14 of the Revelation. So we turn to the scriptural text. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood 
on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in their forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle, on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had the power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. The series of supplemental visions written, as it were, on the outside of the apocalyptic scroll, which we noticed in our 25th lecture as entered upon at the beginning of Revelation 12, is continued to the end of chapter 14. While the beast, the usurper of Christ's supremacy, had been exalting himself against God and blaspheming, with clergy and councils aiding and abetting, with Rome for his capital, and with the world wandering after him, worshipping him, and receiving his mark, there were all the while in existence, though trampled on and oppressed, another city and another people, the followers of the Lamb, with their father's name upon their foreheads. They had been, on the commencement of the apostasy, depicted as the subjects of divine grace, 
elected out of the symbolic Israel, and sealed as 144,000, preserved amongst the judgments of false Christendom, and witnessing against the evils that increased around them. They yet remained indestructible and were ultimately triumphant. These 144,000 are now again pictured to St. John, presenting a beautiful and animating contrast to the visions of the anti-Christian beast and his people. While the latter gather round their Romish Babylon and the great image there set up, and do worship the work of their own hands, the true church is represented upon Mount Zion in the presence of the Lamb himself, singing and harping before the throne of God. We have before observed how that upon the cleansing of the figurative temple at the Reformation and the ascent of the witnesses, a voice of thanksgiving arose from the redeemed and gave glory to the God of heaven. It was the same occasion and the same song which is here again supplementally described. We have heard how Luther sang it, Thou, Jesus, art my righteousness, I am thy sin. Thou hast taken on thyself what was mine, thou hast given to me what was thine. It was this doctrine of our sinfulness and Christ's righteousness and blood atoning that was introduced as the very essence into the ritual and services of the Reformed churches and was their distinctive characteristic. Taking, then, this as the Reformed Church's song, what are we to, what are we to understand by there being some who could not learn it? Does it not seem to imply that there would still continue that nominal profession, distinct from real religion, which had before the Reformation marked the course of the Church's progress? Let us then test this form of the history of the Protestant churches from that period to the time of the French Revolution in the end of the 18th century. We pass over Belgium, Spain, Portugal, and Italy, countries where Protestantism was never established, but was expelled as soon as discovered by the papal weapons of the Inquisition, fire and sword, and we pause for a moment on France. Here the Reformation had been introduced under fair auspices and Protestants had more than a century been tolerated and protected. Henry of Navarre, who, after the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day, had renounced the Reformed religion, and so procured for himself the crown, had nevertheless, by the well-known Edict of Nantes, A.D. 1598, confirmed to the Protestants, who now formed a third of the kingdom, the utmost security and freedom. But the revolution of his edict in A.D. 1685 by Louis XIV at the instigation of the Jesuits withdrew this protection and exposed them to prison and death. Forty thousand took refuge in England, while those who remained in France for the most part were obliged to conform to the Romish church. This persecution did not, however, take place until the religious fervor of the Reformed Church had declined and had become in character more of a chivalrous than a Christian body. But what of the countries where Protestantism had been cradled and established? What of northern Germany, Denmark, Holland, and the Reformed cantons of Switzerland? Alas, in each of these, we shall find the predictive clause but too, well, well, but too well verified. In the case of Germany, though the protest of Rome was distinct, and though much orthodox religious profession continued, yet real vital piety waxed colder and colder, and there was little of the holding forth in spirit and in act the word of life, so that when the Thirty Years' War had desolated Germany from 1618 to 1648 and Protestantism itself was periled, it was confessed that the judgment was righteous and well-deserved, but no revival took place. Greater energies were developed, but they were the energies of a bold and intellectual spirit 
judging of Scripture truth by weak philosophy and tending to skepticism and apostasy. The rationalist theology of the latter half of the 18th century was its consequence. Could there be, amongst those who held these views, any understanding of the new song of redemption and justification through the Savior's blood and mediation? Certainly not. The doctrine had been cast off as the creed of a bygone age, and the gospel itself, its inspiration denied, was considered a book adapted only for Judaic times and having but little to do with eternal truth or eternal philosophy. It has been said that the want of liturgies and creeds and church establishments had somewhat to do with this decline of piety on the continent. But if so, what shall be said of England and England's church, with her liturgy and ritual embodying in its services and creeds all the essential doctrines of salvation, and ministered by a regulated and supported clergy, as the eye rests on the two and a half centuries alluded to in a former sketch, from the time when, under Edward uh, VI, the Reformation was perfected, and the liturgy, services, and articles were arranged by Cranmer and others, and contemplates the efforts made by Bishop Land to corrupt that ritual by mixing up with it a pure worship, mysterious popish rites and ceremonies, then the fanaticism of Cromwell's time, then the skepticism and levity of the laity in the reign of Charles II, and then observes the heartlessness and utter want of spirituality in the century following, especially among the clergy, the inference seems plain that no human means can give real piety of heart. God's Spirit must renew and sanctify the spirit of man, or man's heart with man's systems must fail. Such we infer to be the lesson taught in the vision before us, in the in that no man could learn the song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. There were many eminent men who during this dark period were used by God as instruments to help forward the light of truth and keep alive the fire of true devotion. In Germany, for example, Art, Spener, and Frank of the Lutheran Church, beside many of the Moravian body, in England, within the established church, Hooker and Ken, Usher and Hall, Lighton and Beveridge, Hopkins and Walter, Newton and Venn, amongst the nonconformists, Baxter and Howe, Watts and Doddridge, Whitfield and Wesley, these with many others, and of honorable women not a few, stand out in relief as honored by God in the promotion of his glory. America, too, had its burning and shining lights. Doubtless, there were many more during these years of comparative darkness, unmarked by any save by the eye which sees all, of whose character the scripture gives beautiful testimony. As to purity of heart and holiness, they are virgins, the Lamb's affiant bride. As to active, practical, and self-denying conduct, they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These, if they did not suffer under the hostility of popish adversaries, were yet oft times compelled to go without the camp, bearing the reproach of Christ their Lord. He that knoweth them that are his in this place pointedly marks his approval. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Their record was on high, but justice has in our days been done to them. We rejoice to think that with numbers their writings are now esteemed, their memory is blessed. As the 18th century advanced, the voice of the 144,000 waxed fainter and feebler, and their existence might to the outward eye of man appear a doubtful matter, especially in the continental countries and churches. 
In Germany, rationalism ruled supreme, and its spirit extended to the kindred churches of Sweden and Denmark. In Holland, a lethargy that denoted the absence of all spirituality in life was the prevailing character of the Protestant religion. In Switzerland, Unitarian thought, with its paralyzing influence, had blighted the true doctrine which Calvin once had so fully confessed and taught. Thus, though symptoms were not wanting, which showed that popery was becoming aged and reft of much of its former vigor, yet, in case of any new attack upon gospel truth, such as might arise from threatening infidelity, there appeared in the declining state of piety on all sides but little zeal or power to oppose it, neither amongst the Protestants or the Romish churches. In England almost alone it seemed that the salt had not, not absolutely lost all savor. The light, as well nigh extinct, began to burn brighter. Elsewhere the darkness thickened. We're going to pause here for a little break at uh, page 187 of The Last Prophecy. I'd like to get a copy of this so you can get one absolutely free by going to my website, crosstheborder.org. Find the free ebook tab there and follow the instructions. And uh, both of these will be made available to you. The rapture will be canceled and the last prophecy, uh, Hori Apocalyptica 2015. Uh, which we're using right now in our study of the book of Revelation, which is an abridgment. The, the last prophecy is an abridgment of E.B. Eliot's uh, work, the Hori Apocalyptica, which is the most exhaustive work ever done on the book of Revelation. And I hope you're enjoying the exposition of this work, which we will continue in a few minutes. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening Across the border, we're continuing our study here in the Book of Revelation, using E. B. Eliot's Hori Apocalyptica as a guide, and more specifically, that the abridgment of that great work, the Last Prophecy. Uh, we're on page uh, 187, so let's just pick up there and continue. Could it be that the Blessed Reformation had ended in failure? 
If such a doubt had crossed the mind of St. John at this point, the next vision must have dissipated it. When the missionary angel was seen to fly in the midst of heaven, giving glorious token of, the, of revival and triumph to the church, as also of warning to those who either opposed or still neglected the message. When Jesus at the synagogue of Nazareth opened the Bible to Isaiah 61 and read the verse to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, he closed the book and giving it to the minister, he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled, announcing himself as the appointed prophet to deliver this message from God. To preach the day of vengeance was not his commission. The gospel, he declared, must first be published among all nations. Here then, ere the end come, we have the angel commissioned again with the everlasting gospel to preach that them that dwell on the earth and bidding every nation and kindred and tongue and people fear God and give him glory. He announces also the startling fact, the hour of his judgment is come. He claims the reverence due to omnipotence as God's right. Worship him that made the heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. This vision, however, as also the two following, are in this supplementary, are without written series, giving only in brief, and each is taken up afterwards in the regular or without written course as a separate and distinct occurrence. The former we shall have to notice in a following lecture. The two latter belong to unfulfilled prophecy and are consequently beyond the scope of our present design. Again, E.B. Elliot writing about 1865. Meanwhile, there are words of comfort given to the children of God at the very first announcement of the vile judgments. The first angel brings with him the gospel or glad tidings to all before pronouncing the woe that must follow its rejection. The second angel announces the speedy fall of Babylon, that enemy and rival of the Christian church, while a third pronounces woe upon those who still remain in her once the call is go gone forth. Even the wine of the wrath of God and fiery destruction adding, here is, or will be shown, the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Before announcing the awful final judgments, another angel or voice from heaven declares, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord, and the Spirit of God himself gives the encouragement. They rest from their labors, and their works follow them. How terrible, and yet how precious, is the word of God, according as it is addressed to the unbelieving or to the faithful. Like the pillar of fire, it is a cloud and darkness to them, but it gives light to these. Page 189, Lecture 27, The Seventh Trumpet, The Vials, Era of the French Revolution, A.D. 1789, through 1830. Here read chapters 15 and 16 of the Revelation. So we jump to our scripture text now, and we jump to chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and then that had gotten victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, O thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, and all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. 
and the seven angels came out of the temple, having seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth for ever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, and from his power no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Chapter 16 And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell noisome and grievous sore upon men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And a third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angels of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and wast, and shall be, because thou hast judged Thou hast judged thus, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that make the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such that was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. It will be remembered that the several visions which have intervened between the end of chapter 11 and this chapter 15, now before us, have been regarded as supplemental, added, as it were, on the back or outside of the apocalyptic seven-sealed scroll. The original and direct written series is now about to be resumed at the historic point at which it had been broken off, i.e. the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Before entering, however, on the explanation of that vision, and the eventful accomplishments therein portended, our attention is directed to the position occupied by God's elect and faithful people during the destructive action 
of the seven vials, a sea, as it were, of glass mingled with fire is seen appearing, probably like vitrified lava, such as would be the effect of a volcano. It is doubtful what locality is re represented, but as the Babylon of the Revelation is shown to be destroyed by fire, it may designate some part of the territory of the beast. Moreover, it is intended to show the safety of the Church of God during the political eruptions of the French Revolution, that great event which in its several developments presents the solution of the symbol of the seven vials, the harper standing upon the margin of the sea and singing thanksgiving to God, would seem to represent the spiritual Israel upon their escape from the figurative Egypt as the literal Israel of old did when delivered from the judgment plagues and from the pursuing hosts of Pharaoh and the songs of confidence and triumph which they sang under the guidance and direction of Moses and here taken to express the faith in which the true believers repose in the strength of Christ their paschal lamb and the hope in which they anticipate their speedy establishment in the heavenly Canaan, the land of promise, when all nations shall come and worship before him. And now, as was also depicted in Revelation 11.19, the temple is visibly opened in heaven, and the Ark of the Covenant appears, indicating that at the time there would be a manifestation of the true church of Christ before the world, as to character, principles, expectations, and influence, so as it had never been before exhibited, yet was the confluence of the nations into it, in the full extent of the promise, to be yet deferred till the vile plagues had been first poured out. For this purpose, seven angels came forth from the temple, denoting that all approaching political con convulsions of Christendom were ordered by the Lord's providence, inasmuch as the vials of wrath were put into the angel's hands by one of the living creatures, it is implied that the vindication of their wrongs and injuries is the design and intent of these judgments. The vial or cup is often introduced in Scripture to represent God's judicial infliction upon his enemies. Thus, in the hand of the Lord is a cup, and the wine is red, is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out. Again, behold, I have taken out of thy hand the cup of trembling, and I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee. The similarity of the four first vials to the four first trumpets cannot escape observation. The localities, as well as other figures, are almost identical. The earth, the land division of Western Roman Christendom, the sea, its maritime colonies, the rivers, those two boundaries, the Rhine and Danube, and their valleys, the sun, the ruling emperor, of one-third of the Roman earth, all these symbols and their significations remain pretty much the same. The time to which the prophecy appears to point, as the period of the seventh trumpet sounding, is at the outbreak of the French Revolution in the year 1798. This was preceded by a short interval of warning from the passing away of the Turkish woe about A.D. 1774, marked out by the prophetic notice, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The general tranquility of Europe in that interval indicated to ordinary view no sign of approaching disturbance. Russia, although it comprehended those wilds whence long since the barbarian scourge of Christendom had poured forth, was now a civilized empire. Modern Germany with its 2,300 walled towns, presented obstacles to invasion unknown in earlier ages. The rancor of religious differences had all but subsided, and a balance of power forbade the idea of either 
party being strong for aggression. The late democratic revolt of America would have, it was thought, no effect on European principalities, and the Peace of Versailles in 1783 was supposed to bode a long repose to Europe. There were, however, two opposite classes who watched the tendencies of events with interest. The one was that of the infidel philosophers in France, headed by Voltaire, men who, aided by wit and science, left no means untried to effect the object for which they conspired, the overthrow of Christianity. Republican clubs and cheap infidel revolutionary publications served under their direction to undermine the principles of the different ranks of society, and without religion to control them, the mass of the people were ready for any outbreak against government and social order. The Christian philosopher also foresaw an outbreak, not such as the former looked for, but one of wrath and judgment. The abounding iniquity must needs meet with punishment. He heard the wheels of an avenging God groan heavily along the road. The unwanted convulsion of the elements, which just then occurred, drew notice of the thoughtful observers and filled them with fearful forebodings. Tempests and volcanoes, earthquakes and hurricanes, ere long destructive and frequent, it was an allusion to this unnatural state of the elements, and especially with reference to an earthquake which lasted three years from 1783 to 1786 that Cowper writes, the world appears to toll the death bell of its own disease, and by the voice of all its elements to preach the general doom. Thus, as in some other parts of sacred scripture, the literal and figurative seemed alike joined in the prediction. When the seventh trumpet sounded, there were lightnings, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. Then the French Revolution broke out. In the meeting of the National Assembly, the Republican Party gained the ascendancy, and at once proceeded to abolish the laws, rights, and customs of the French nation, the privileges and titles of the nobility, the ties of the clergy, and the supremacy of the king were sacrificed to popular power and caprice. All that might have appeared most stable in church and state was overthrown. It is at this period the vital judgments may have been supposed to begin. First vial. And the first angel went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, etc. One of the plagues of Egypt was a noisome ulcer. Here, then, is the spiritual Egypt that same expression is used. The angel of the first trumpet sounded, and fire fell on the earth. On the same locality, the sore indicates the outbreak of some corruption which had been festering within, and which, breaking out, would spread its infection and produce great distress, and so it was, a tremendous outbreak of social and moral evil, democratic and popular fury, atheism and vice, characterized the French Revolution. From France, as the, a center, the plague rapidly spread through its affiliated clubs, and the whole of papal Christendom soon imbibed the poison and shared the punishment. At the first, its character was by many mistaken, and the movement was hailed as the harbinger of liberty and the overthrow of despotism, but it quickly unfolded itself. First came the atrocious assault upon the palace of Versailles and the forcible abduction of the monarch. Then the National Assemblies declaration of the rights of man, a code of open rebellion against all order and rule, followed by the confiscation of the church estates and the ascendancy of the Jacobin clubs to power. Then another and more ferocious attack on the palace, the dethronement of the king, and the massacre of the Swiss guards and of the five hundred royalists, soon followed 
the trial and execution of both king and queen with that of other royal persons and the avowed declaration of war against all authority. Then came the reign of terror under Robespierre, the revolutionary tribunal, the horrid massacres at La Vendée and Lyon, men and women drowned in couples, and vessels filled with captives then sunk, which atrocities they termed republican baptisms and marriages, to say nothing of the innumerable multitude shot down, roasted alive, and drowned in the moss. Lastly, as the acme of iniquity, the threat of dethroning the king of heaven, the public renunciation of Christianity, the worship of an abandoned woman as the goddess of reason, the abolition of the Sabbath and all other institutions connected with religion, the sacraments profane, travesty, the, a sacramental cup with new wine being brought into the street, and an ass made openly to drink of it. Such was the development of the real character of the revolution. Surely the whole head was sick and the heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there was no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. It was as if God had said of it, As of Ephraim, he is joined to idols, let him alone. It was upon men having the mark of the beast that this vial was poured out. The clergy were Romanists and suffered fearfully, as did the Romish laity. But independently of this, the conduct of the Republicans was the recompense of what they had learned to esteem a popish tyranny. And it was now turned against those who had long diligently sowed the seeds of oppression. And we're going to pick up next time here with the second vial being poured out about the time of the French Revolution. May the Almighty bless you each and every day as you walk in his kingdom. We'll see you next time. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a Third Temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, 
acrosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthborder.org.